Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa White. I am the Membership Services Manager for CML, and it is a pleasure to have you join us today for our webinar on Integrated Project Delivery 101. Those of you that are elected officials will receive one university training credit. Today's presentation, the PowerPoint, is on our website at cml.org under Training Materials. We are also planning to record it, and that will be posted to our website probably early next week, that link. So if you want to review the program again or maybe forward it to a colleague who wasn't able to participate, you'll certainly be able to do that. For those of you not familiar with the webinar format, you'll see a control panel to the top right of the screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of the panel, which will minimize that box. All participants will be muted for the webinar, and at the end, we encourage you to type questions into the question box on the control panel. We will then answer questions at that time. I'd like to briefly introduce you to our presenters today. First, we have Lefwin Clark. Lefwin is Planner and Senior Sales Director with 30 years experience in the water, transportation, and environmental sectors. For the past 20 years, he has been focused on the evolution of collaborative delivery to solve infrastructure challenges. His recent efforts include the development of decision criteria and analysis tools for the full spectrum of project delivery methodologies in support of various owner advisory roles. He holds an Urban Studies undergraduate degree from Columbia College in the City of New York and a Master's degree in Urban Planning from the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Joe Willich leads Brown and Caldwell's project development for integrated project delivery in Colorado with 32 years of experience in the construction market building water and wastewater treatment plants and infrastructure projects across the country. He holds a bachelor's degree in construction technology and a master's degree in business administration. You're clearly in great hands today. I'm gonna to turn it over to our presenters. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on with the slides here. Uh, this first slide is a project from Georgia for a very large uh, project that was done design build. Uh, it was actually an award winner for a number of categories, uh, including Design Build Institute of America. And we're gonna talk about uh, DBIA here a little bit later. Oh, by the way, my name is Joe Willich. So our agenda today is we're going to hit on the basics of integrated project delivery. We're then going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, integrated project delivery. We're going to take a few minutes to introduce the Water Design Build Council and the Design Build Institute of America, and then we'll go on to questions. First, we want to talk about, uh, you can see the title says Integrated Project Delivery, which is the title of this webinar. You see alternative, crossed out, and collaborative delivery. Uh, there's a lot of terms being used in the industry. Uh, all of them are trying to project the same information. Uh, the world's starting to move away from calling it alternative delivery. It's been around for 25 plus years now. Um, and you'll see the definition here that uh, uh, talks about collaborative project delivery. The idea is that everybody's working together, openly sharing information, openly sharing data, and that's between the owner, designer, the builder, maybe other stakeholders. And really, that's what the integration part's all about, is everybody working together, really from the outset of a project and bringing the best ideas forward. Wanted to hit on Colorado state law here for just a few minutes. So uh, the Public Projects Act, and you can look this up, you can see the citation there, uh, goes into great detail about integrated uh, project delivery. Uh, we've just got a little bit of the key information here, but I'd, I'd recommend that you look up the citation, that you read it in detail. Uh, so there's a short definition here of integrated project delivery. And what it talks about is, and I'm not gonna read it all, uh, it's a single particip participating entity for design, construction, alteration, operation, repair, improvement, demolition, maintenance, or financing, or any combination of these services. So that's a pretty wide open definition uh, for public agencies to do these kind of projects uh, under this delivery method. Uh, 
if you go on, it says any agency may award an IPD contract for a public project. So uh, by state law, it is available to you. Uh, I'm going to go on here to the next slide. And uh, the act goes on to talk about the procurement process. And that procurement process could be what's known as a two-step process, where you go out and do a request for qualifications, you have evaluation criteria, and you select uh, who you think are the best firms, uh, typically called a shortlist, to go on and receive a request for a proposal. So state law allows all that. Uh, it also calls out that proposals must be evaluated on some uh, key criteria, and, and that's listed here. Uh, technical approach, past performance, uh, and experience, project management capabilities, craft labor capabilities, in addition to other factors you may have. Uh, and law also allows for what's most advantageous to the agency and is the best value for your project. Uh, the law also says that you can select a proposal on the basis other than solely the lowest cost. So I'm going to introduce a few of the delivery methods we're going to talk about here today. Leftwind is going to go into greater detail on these delivery methods in a few minutes. Uh, up on the screen is the traditional method, uh, typically known as design bid bill. So you can see that represented there. Um, and then we move into what we call collaborative delivery. So that begins with construction management at risk, commonly known as CMAR. Um, Again, left one's going to go into more detail here, so I won't steal his thunder. Um, design build, we're going to talk about two different delivery options. Uh, one is called progressive design build, and the other is called fixed price design build. Before we get into uh, talking more about the details of those delivery methods, uh, let's talk about what are good reasons for design build. So a few questions we're going to pose here that we ask that you think about as we go through the presentation. Um, are, is there a good reason for schedule acceleration? Uh, does it give you innovation for your projects uh, and or potential cost savings? Does it help you avoid low bid quality uh, or perhaps avoid excessive change orders? Uh, and perhaps you just want to try an alternative approach. Um, and we hear that from a lot of owners. They just want the opportunity to deliver their projects in a different fashion. So somewhere along the way, you got to try. Uh, and then if you have a number of projects that are overloading your procurement system, uh, you'll learn more about this in a minute, uh, design build may be a way to lessen that load. So some questions for you to think about. Uh, I'm going to talk about some survey results. The Water Design Bill Council in 2012 did a pretty extensive survey with uh, owners and their staff. Uh, and on this particular slide, we're going to talk about the top three reasons uh, people cited using design build. And this came from directly from the project managers. Uh, so comparing design build benefits against design bid build. You'll see, um, and there's a legend up in the top right here, uh, you'll see for schedule effectiveness, design build was greater than 70% more effective than design bid build. Uh, you can see uh, about 20% of the respondents were, were neutral. When it came to innovations, about 60 plus percent uh, found a lot of innovations with design build as a top reason. And then the third reason was cost effectiveness. Again, that was nearly 60%. So these are pretty good results and, and pretty telling. Uh, when we look a little deeper into that survey uh, and we talk about innovation, you're going to see that uh, here's some of the top reasons why people use design build. 91% said they would do it again. 82% uh, said they saved time and about two thirds said they saved money. You're going to notice, though, that uh, innovative ideas that were used to save time and money and improve quality was at 89%, almost 90%. And that's a pretty stunning result when you think about it. I, th I suspect when people went into the survey that uh, they didn't realize that was going to be perhaps the top uh, indicator of why this is a good delivery method. Um, so 
one of the best things you can get out of this is actually uh, create innovation for your project. I'm going to turn it over now to Lefwin. He's going to talk more about the uh, collaborative project delivery options. Good afternoon. So you're, th this is Lefwin Clark. Um, you're looking at uh, the spectrum of collaborative project delivery options here. And these uh, funny little circular diagrams have some uh, meaning and purpose behind them. So we'll take just a second here to to talk about what you're what you're seeing on the screen with the colors and the symbology. Um, for those of you who've ever been at a design build conference or seen some of the materials in previous years, we used to use little stick figures to show the relationships of um, contracts in all these various models. And these figures are uh, credited to the Water Design Build Council in their most recent handbook. And we'll we'll give you um, uh, the the access point for that handbook at the end of the presentation if you're interested. But they're really intended to illustrate these delivery models in terms of the relationships between the parties and the roles between the parties. And so if you look at the symbology, starting with the colors, um, most of you would fall in the green category as the owner. In some of these uh, models and, and delivery methods are sometimes supported by an owner's advisor working um, with the owner to help procure the project and then deliver it. And then as we move through the models, you'll start seeing uh, different um, players. Uh, we call the cast or the role players in the play, starting with engineers and constructors and moving as we move through the spectrum to, to design builders. The other thing you'll see here is these funny little puzzle pieces. And those are representative of contracts. And contractual relationships form the foundation of any delivery method, but they differ significantly in how um, they play out in, as you go across the spectrum here. And so we'll talk a lot about where there are contractual relationships, in some cases, fundamentally no relationships, and where there is an embedded relationship, it's illustrated by the, the little dotted line here on many of these graphics where an embedded relationship is really fundamental to the model succeeding, but it's not contractual. It's implied and, and created um, from the way the model is delivered in practice. And so um, since those relationships are not contractual, sometimes they work out well, and sometimes they don't work out quite as well. And so that's um, part of the consideration in, in dealing with these models of where you have contractual relationships or relationships that are assumed or um, uh, delivered via practice rather than contract. So that said, we'll walk through each of these models in a little bit of detail. Um, you see traditional on the left, that's design, bid, build, as um, Joe pointed out. Uh, and then it starts with construction management at risk. And this is really, from that point to the right, is a really collaborative delivery. And then as you get farther to the right, it becomes more technically design build. So we'll start with design bid build. And this is um, the starting point that most of you should be familiar with. It's the way the, the majority of public works projects are procured today. And certainly historically, the way most uh, projects have been uh, procured for the better part of a century, at least. It's traditional um, and it involves a cast of characters that you all recognize in terms of owners, um, engineers or architects, and, um, and uh, contractors. And so it's very well established. It's a very defined linear process. And I suspect all of you who have any form of procurement policy or regulation or even a, a informal system in your, your various municipalities, you, you all know and embrace this system. It's the way things have traditionally been done. Um, it has very distinct milestones. You know when things are going to happen. Uh, we find that a lot of owners are not necessarily um, happy with the order that things happen, but they're certainly well defined. Um, and it is fundamentally based on the concept of design being completed um, more or less 100% or almost 100% before you go out and bid the construction. And so your bidding is completed then before you move into construction. 
and it's done by a contractor. And so um, the legend on this slide, um, really the, the orange or brownish color is the construction contractor and the blue is, is the uh, designer. It could be an engineer on a water wastewater infrastructure project or a transportation project. It could be an architect uh, on a vertical or a building type project. Um, if you look at the way these puzzle pieces fits together on this model, um, clearly as an owner, you have a uh, distinct relationship with the professional services entity like an engineer or architect, and you have a separate contractual relationship with the contractor. And, and those are established at different points in time. And the contractor and the engineer, as illustrated by the gap at the bottom of the circle, actually have no contractual relationship with each other. And in many cases, it's expected that they don't have uh, much of a working relationship or even a hands-off relationship with each other. All the information flows back to the owner and it's up to the owner to adjudicate um, any discrepancies between the design and the construction. And this is the funder, fundamental underlying uh, reason why you might have change orders in a project uh, because of the way this process is set up. If you want to think of it in a more um, more uh, casual vernacular for those of you who had kids in the back seat and um, you're driving the car around. Um, design bid build is really having two kids in the back seat and if they get along um, that's great um, but if they get into a tiff um, you're the parent leaning over the, the front seat to the back saying um, you know we gotta we gotta you guys gotta stop hitting each other and, and you're responsible for breaking up the fight. So we'll play that analogy out as we go through some of the other um, delivery models. Be because of that dynamic, we've seen a lot of owners and a lot of, uh, um, of the construction industry promote um, a variation on traditional delivery, which is much more collaborative, called construction management at risk. Some places call it uh, GMCC, GMGC, and some places call it GCCM in the Northwest. And, and it's fundamentally still a traditional delivery method, but it changes up um, the order of things a bit. Um, it's still separate contracts between an owner and a designer or an architect and a construction uh, company who delivers the work in the field. However, uh, it does change the, re the bid timeline. And instead of bidding a project after design is done, a uh, contractor is hired uh, concurrent with the design process. And most um, CMAR best practices um, actually recommend the contractor be hired as early in the design process as possible. 30% design level is, is uh, a number that's often put out there as the right time to hire the contractor. And we've certainly seen cases where the contractor and the designer are, are hired at the same time. But that procurement of the designer and the contractor um, is separate and uh, the design contract or professional services uh, part of this equation is done the same way as you would do it in normal design bid build. But since you're hiring the contractor earlier in the process, you don't have um, the ability to, to have them give you a full bid because the design's not done yet. So the selection of the contractor in this model is quite a bit different. It's, it's performed much more like you would for a professional services entity, and the contractor is hired based on qualifications, past experience, their approach to the project, um, their references, and, and the like. Um, and since they can't have a hard bid number, their fees are usually bid just, just as that, as fees, as a percentage of markup, um, that they're going to put on the job when they eventually go build it. The issue with that, of course, is that the, um, the work to develop the estimate for the construction of the project has to be done on an open book basis so that you can apply those fees to real known costs. So to just talk through this model a bit more, it is very um, much aligned with traditional delivery. It can be faster because your contractor is involved earlier you can actually start construction on parts of the design that are more advanced than others. Uh, so some owners do it for speed. Um, 
It does allow traditional selection of your consulting engineer or your architect, and it does allow a much expanded effort in value engineering because you have your contractor or your builder at the table during the design process. They're engaged. Still two contracts, so if you look at the, the, the uh, diagram, you still have um, the parent sitting in the front seat with the two kids in the back, but you do now have um, a tie, uh, an explicit expectation that the designer or the architect talk to the contractor during the course of the design and that they work together. They're expected to get along, and that's why this is called a delab collaborative delivery method. The dotted uh, contractual piece there that you see in the in the contractor color is is where you see a, a fundamental concept that will emerge in the design build models, and that's the idea of working on this open book basis while the design is being done, developing the cost estimate as you go, and then arriving at a construction price interactively, and applying that fit that fee that the the contractor bid as part of their original proposal to the cost to then develop a price. And that price is generally a guaranteed maximum price. Sometimes it's a lump sum price, it can be either. And that dotted uh, puzzle piece that you see there is that milestone where you shift from all of the contractor's work supporting the design process, um, that's often called the pre-construction period, to converting um, their contract from design support and estimating and value engineering and planning and putting out um, subcontract packages for bid um, that to, to transfer that to a um, guaranteed maximum price and actually move to the field. And this, this diagram is fairly uh, simplistic because you can actually have multiple uh, phased GMPs for early works uh, where you can accelerate the schedule and, and get the contractor working on foundations or early dirt work early in this model. The, the one thing I would leave you with with CMAR though, and is often um, um, left out of the discussion, is it is a traditional delivery method. It is two contracts, and both design, bid, build, and CMAR rely on the concept of standard of care by the designer. And so um, ultimately design discrepancies, errors and omissions, they flow back to the owner. Um, when you get to the field with a CMAR contract, if um, something's not right with the design and despite all the collaboration, it hasn't been caught yet, um, the change order potential from the contractor is the same. Ultimately on these, these uh, traditional models, um, design bid build or construction management risk, these two contract models, the designer is committed to designing a project that will work as, as, um, as one might expect from a high level of standard of care by looking at what other professional services architects or engineers might have done. There is no embedded guarantee, however, that that design will actually work. You, are, you as an owner are buying the plans and you're buying professional expertise and expectation with those plans, but if the builder builds them as designed um, and it doesn't, ultimately um, produce the wastewater that you expect or the water that you expect or the, the bridge isn't uh, quite have the structural um, integrity that um, you expected out of it. Uh, the, the recourse is back to the designer in, in uh, standard of care circumstances. The contractor has actually no responsibility as long as they built it as the, as the plan said. And so Ultimately, the owner owns the risk in these models, and, and that's the way it's been. Um, and good architects and engineers stand behind their work, and, and um, you often don't confront an issue where something doesn't um, you know, work as promised. And, and uh, all of the good firms that we work for do their best, but, but you do have to realize it is a standard of care promise, and you are buying the plans. And so, um, I often describe um, construction management at risk as a precursor to design build. Some people call it design build light because it looks very much like design build. Uh, the other analogy that I've used, if you think of um, design build uh, that we'll talk about in a minute as being a marriage, 
Um, construction management at risk is really a, a, a roommate situation. You have a designer and a contractor working together. They live in the same space, and it's all great as long as everybody gets along. Um, as soon as you have a fight over the phone bill or who takes out the trash, you can have the same sort of um, adjudication and change order issues that you might have in a design bid bill. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's take a look um, at uh, the design build. And now we're really crossing a significant line in the delivery spectrum here. Um, where CMAR was collaborative, we're now moving to collaborative delivery that is design build. And design build as a, as a delivery model has a lot of different flavors and names and uh, variations. And what we've tried to do with the Water Design Build Council and the DBIA is add some consistency to the definitions of the different types of design build. But there's still a lot out there and there's really no pure form um, of any particular model. Uh, most owners, particularly ones with more complex projects, are using parts and pieces of all these models. But there are really two fundamental forms of design build, something called progressive design build and something called fixed price design build. And that's what we'll focus on here today. Um, there's also design build operate. We won't touch on that, but um, either of these models could involve a longer term follow on operations and maintenance component to it as well. So you can keep that in mind, but even though we won't touch on it much today. Fundamental to design build though, is that it is a single entity. You have a, as an owner, a single contract with a design builder. That design builder can be a purpose built team, a consortium, partnership, a joint venture, or a single company in many instances that does the, the professional services and deliver the construction. So let's talk about progressive design build first and then fixed price. <clears throat> Progressive design build, like all design build models, is a single entity. It's purpose built. Um, in the progressive design build model, you develop the design detail and constructive es construction estimate iteratively between the owner and the design builder. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see from the diagram here now that the owner in green has one a contractual relationship with a single entity. Many owners hire an owner advisor for design build um, support, um, and that owner advisor has a very strong working relationship with the design builder. For progressive design build, um, you do gain a pretty significant schedule opportunity because you can do many activities concurrently. We've shifted from a very linear process at the design bid build model to a much more a fast track or overlapping process where you can start many phases of construction before the rest of the design is complete. <clears throat> you generally uh, select a design builder in this model based on qualifications and fee, not a fixed price. And so if you think of the CMAR model, this is very similar except now you're doing a single procurement with your designer and your design builder and you're um, using very much a professional services model to make that selection. Uh, as Joe mentioned, it's often a two-phase selection process uh, with qualifications and then a short list and then a, a proposal. You then work uh, through the design process and uh, arrive at that dotted puzzle piece where very much like CMAR, you have a um, point in time where you convert um, either all of the project or a phase of the project to a guaranteed maximum price, um, sometimes a lump sum, and uh, you have then go forth and build the project. Um, many, many of these contract models for progressive design build um, keep the books open after construction starts. That's the GMP option. And, and as costs are accrued and uh, allocated through the project, if there's anything left over, those are often shared. And uh, there's a mutual incentive for the design builder to um, work below even the agreed upon price and either add scope to the project or, or share the savings with the owner as you go along. Um, all of these models, and I should have mentioned it on, uh, on uh, CMAR as well, 
all of these models generally have what's called an off-ramp. And the off-ramp um, lets you as the owner make the choice that you don't actually agree on the price that the, the CMAR contractor or the progressive design builder in this case are coming up with. And so if you get far advanced into the design process and the costs are not accruing to your budget or you don't believe that the subcontract bids are competitive or that the design builder is being um, uh, forthright in their open book pricing, you do have the option to pull the plug, take the off ramp and you can go finish the design in a traditional manner, bid out the work um, through, a, through a standard uh, hard bid contracting process. That's the carrot and the stick to keep everybody honest on uh, developing cost and, um, and um, an incentive to get to the GMP on a, on a forthright basis. Um, the key thing to remember though, when, you, when you're doing one of these design build single contract models is that when you do get to construction, there is a commitment to the performance of the project. There is an embedded um, ability to hold the design builder responsible for what the, the outputs of the project or the form of the project is supposed to be. And if the project doesn't meet those contractual performance criteria, it's on the design builder to fix it. And um, that's the critical shift we've now made from a CMAR model to a progressive design build model. That's the, the, the analogy I was using earlier, the difference between being roommates versus being um, you know, fundamentally married and responsible internal to the team as a design builder to deliver the project. And any disputes around discrepancy between the uh, characterization of the design and how it's implemented in the field uh, and built in the field, those are, are uh, issues that have to be adjudicated uh, internal to that team, whether it's a, a joint venture or some form of relationship between a construction company and engineer, it, it becomes not the owner's problem at that point. And so if you go back to our analogy of kids in the backseat of your car, you've now put a big, um, one of those chauffeur's panels up and uh, you, can, you can shut them out. And if they're gonna argue, they're gonna do it out of your ear sight and eyesight. And um, what you can hold them accountable for is the, is the uh, you know, performance of the project. Now progressive design build is a model that was um, evolved out of the design build um, toolbox to allow the owner to stay involved in the design process. And uh, we'll move to fixed price in a minute, but one of the biggest differences between this model and, and fixed price is that you don't enter the relationship with the design builder with a, with a full scope uh, of the project done yet, or, nor a fixed price for construction. And so what that allows is for the owner to participate in the decision making and the prioritization during the design process. And it allows uh, the owner to make um, and participate in the tough budget decisions as the design is done iteratively. Uh, whenever the scope goes above what you have to spend, um, the project can be realigned and it's essentially a design to budget exercise but uh, the owner is involved in that process throughout. And so for owners who want to maintain control, this is, this is the way to go. It's also a, a very uh, good way to go if you have a, a, a complex permitting process um, where you need a lot of iteration and multiple design um, iterations to, to do permit submittals. And finally, we get to pick, fix price design build. Um, this is what most people think of when they say design build. Um, this is, again, a single contract model. Um, and the design detail and construction, um, they come in as a fixed price as part of the proposal process. As you might imagine, the proposal process is much more complex because now you're asking the uh, competitors to um, perform a significant amount of design as part of their submittal uh, to the point where they can price it uh, on a committed fixed price way. Um, these are almost always done in a two phase process because um, you uh, want a short list and have just a few bidders give you a number. 
Um, it does lengthen the procurement process, but it reduces the delivery time considerably because once that design builder is selected, what they're going to build for you is, is as bid and they go do it. And so a lot of owners use this um, when they don't care necessarily to be involved in detailed design. Um, they get design submittals as part of the process. They pick one and they go forth. And it's essentially a design competition. And um, it can include operations and maintenance in many cases, and it can even include financing. Uh, this would be the foundation of a P3 delivery as well. And so um, you see a lot of larger complex projects and in infrastructure using this model. Um, it's a little complex sometimes for smaller projects. And you can, uh, you can also use it to get going quite quickly once the design builder is selected. So that's the uh, fundamental models. We'll flip it back to Joe here, who will do a quick comparison of the advantages and disadvantages of each. Thanks, Lefwin. So we're going to go back and uh, use the owner survey information we talked about earlier from the Water Design Bill Council. And coming out of that owner's survey, uh, these are the top five concerns about managing design build projects. So uh, number one was anticipating unknowns, uh, completing on budget, completing the project on schedule, uh, the question of uh, the concern of the design control. Uh, many owners are concerned that they have incomplete design build knowledge, and we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, how to learn more about education. And then uh, proper risk allocation. And so we're going to go on and talk a little bit deeper about proper risk allocation. Uh, a lot of times you hear design build as a means of transferring risk. And there's truth to that. Um, but it's not necessarily just uh, shifting risk completely. Uh, it's really about how do you share the risk. Uh, the owner never completely sheds all risk. There's some responsibilities that are going to remain and, and, and in a number of instances the owner is going to be the best person to control and manage some risks anyway. So talking about proper risk allocation. So yes, project design uh, can be transferred as a risk to a design builder. As Lefwin was describing, uh, progressive design build is perhaps uh, one of the better ways to do that. Uh, it can be done in fixed price design build as well too. And really the message is uh, if you're too prescriptive on your uh, design criteria, bridging documents, in other words, you've taken the design to a fairly high level, say 30% or more, and then uh, seek out a design builder, in a large way, you've already made a lot of major decisions uh, about the design process. And to a certain extent, you're going to retain some ownership of that. Uh, schedule is definitely an opportunity for risk transfer to a design builder. You know, they're going to sign up to a, a, a scope and a price, uh, whether it's a GMP or, or a lump sum. And they're going to agree to provide the project uh, in a certain time frame, and you can hold them responsible for that. Uh, some permits and approvals can be transferred. Uh, this is an area where some permits, some approvals are going to be best controlled and managed by the owner. It's difficult to shift those to necessarily uh, a design builder. Uh, and, and really, that just leads into a discussion of uh, which permits, which approvals belong to which party. Uh, one of the great opportunities for transferring risk is, uh, you know, if you're talking about a project that's a facility, is transferring the output in terms of quantity and quality. Uh, in other words, if you have a wastewater treatment plant and um, the criteria might be that the output must meet your NIPTES permit, uh, you can hold that design builder accountable for what they've designed and built that's going to uh, effectively treat the effluent to meet, meet those permit requirements. Uh, cost of construction project, that, that's a, a primary risk transfer. 
Uh, and then also facility performance and acceptance testing. You know, when you think back to what Leflin described for design bid bill, uh, the owner hires a designer, they design it, the owner then hires, bids out, and a contractor builds the project. That contractor is not responsible for the facility performance. That's based on the design done by the designer. Uh, so if they build it and they build it correctly, according to the construction specs and the construction drawings, uh, and it doesn't perform, really that's the owner and the designer trying to figure out what to do about it. In a design build project, really uh, you've transferred that risk to the design builder. And then also uh, to expand, you can look at life cycle costs, uh, including operations, maintenance, repair, and replacement. So uh, there's an opportunity for risk transfer there too, so you get the right balance of capital investment versus uh, maintenance costs and reliability of the system. So we're going to talk about delivery methods. And we're going to talk about a summary here uh, fairly briefly because we're starting to get to the end of our time. So I might group a few of these together. Uh, so when we look at design bid build versus uh, CMAR versus the design build options, you know, we move from a traditional role to kind of a traditional role, uh, sort of. And really, when you get into design build, it's new roles, uh, different cast of uh, players, as Leflin was describing earlier. Uh, with that, the procurement process is going to change here. Uh, you go away from what you've typically been doing, probably how your systems have been set up, and you're uh, in the CMAR really adapting your current procurement process. However, when you move to design build, you really need some new procurement practices and processes. And, and we're going to talk about that a little bit further when we get to the Water Design Build Council slide, who has some excellent information, and uh, Design Build Institute of America, who also has some excellent resources to use. Um, as was mentioned, you know, design bid build and CMAR are still multiple contracts, multiple procurements, uh, and that's two contracts for an owner to procure, two contracts for an owner to manage. When you go to design build, uh, you're doing really one procurement uh, for that design builder. Now, if you elect an owner's advisor, yes, you got another procurement ahead of that, but typically those are uh, uh, short qualifications-based selections. The, uh, from a schedule standpoint, um, design bid build is linear, usually the longest schedule possible. Um, CMAR, construction management at risk, you can get some schedule acceleration out of that. And really when you move to design build, uh, often cited as, you know, the number one reason or one of the top reasons typically is that it's the fastest delivery model available. You really overlap functions between uh, design and construction, uh, early ordering of long lead items, and you can typically shave off 10%, uh, 25% of your scheduled time, sometimes more. Moving through a few more of these, uh, really design bid build, you're talking about specification based in great detail designs, where when you move to the other end of the spectrum at design build, really talking about the, the preference being performance-based. In other words, describing what you need out of your project in terms of your objectives, your goals, your output uh, in sufficient detail to uh, have it understood and designed and built. Uh, and that's a big shift for a lot of owners uh, and something to take into account. Uh, along with that, we were just talking about the risk transfer. So, uh, you know, design, bid, build, even CMAR, you've got a pretty good long history of how to distribute the risks where with design build, you've actually got some uh, ability to transfer risks, take some of that burden off the owner's shoulders and turn it into a performance-based project. Um, this next line here talks about owner owning delivery issues. Uh, left one had talked about that in detail. Uh, you know, if there's errors, omissions, ambiguities, uh, both with uh, design, bid, build, and CMAR, that's, that's going to fall back on the owner's shoulders to adjudicate. 
where uh, when you move to design build, uh, a lot of those issues, most of those issues are in the hands of design builder. One thing that remains typically consistent though is uh, the discussion about scope and unforeseen conditions. Uh, in some contracts, try, try to move unforeseen conditions to the contractor and, and all these delivery methods. Uh, but typically that kind of risk transfer comes at, comes at a pretty steep price. So in general, uh, nobody, can, nobody can foresee unforeseen conditions and it's something to take into account as you go through any of these procurement methods and how you set up your contracts. So steps to successful DB projects. You know, number one, and, and I see people do this a lot, they'll think about, wow, maybe I ought to just do a design build. Well, don't, don't start there. Don't decide your delivery method as a first step. Really think about the goals and objectives of the project that you're gonna uh, have designed and built. Uh, are you in a hurry because you're confined schedule-wise? Do you have a permitting requirement that perhaps may be driving you schedule-wise? Uh, do you really need innovation? You really need to think through what your project is about and, and uh, actually sit down and, and write it down. Think that through pretty carefully. Uh, next thing you want to think about is, uh, you know, the costs and risks that are going to be involved with the project uh, during your initial planning and think about ways to uh, mitigate those identified risks. Uh, if you start with these two steps, you're on, a, you're on a good track. Now you're ready to talk about what's the best delivery method. You know, in some cases it might be, you know what, design, bid, build is still the way to go. In other instances, uh, CMAR may make more sense and uh, perhaps one of the design build options may, may make more sense for you. You know, left wouldn't mentioned if you're uh, really a hands-on owner, very deeply involved in design. You know what? Progressive design build or CMAR could be the better option for you. So really need to think these things through before just uh, picking a delivery method. Uh, one of the strongest things you can do is uh, talk to your peers, talk to other owners about their experiences, and uh, they're going to share with you pretty openly, and, and that's the best thing you can do to get uh, real first-hand information. Uh, we talked about owner advisors, sometimes called owner representatives. Uh, if you need help, there are independent consultants out there who will provide those services, who can guide you expertly through uh, your project's needs and your objectives and help you make the right decisions. And then, uh, you, this is really important, the owner has to be engaged in this process. This is uh, not a hands-off process. This is, the owner has to be deeply involved. They have to really control the whole project when it's all said and done. That doesn't mean adjudicating every piece and part of the project. That means what we've talked about all along, working collaboratively, uh, but you have to be engaged. And then really, if you're doing design build, make sure you got somebody that's really got the right qualifications, similar projects, um, uh, similar magnitude, etc. We'll, we'll, we'll move to taking some questions here, but we'll leave a couple um, slides on the screen here that for, for excellent resources. The first of these is the Water Design Build Council. It's a group of um, uh, companies that do both the design build, design and build part of design build. Uh, Brown and Caldwell included, and um, I'm the education chair for this organization. It's really focused on education and um, and research, and one of the products that this organization produces is the handbook. You see the picture there. Um, you'll see on your screen a little code to use. For those of you who are owners on this call, that, that code will get you a free copy of the book. If you go online, it's available hard copy or or in PDF form, and and um, you're welcome to uh, uh, go out to the website and, and make sure you designate yourself as an owner, and you'll get a copy of that. Um, the Water Design Build Council, as you might expect, focuses on water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, if you uh, want additional resources, the Design Build Institute of America (DBIA) is a much broader-based organization. It covers all kinds of infrastructure including uh, vertical construction buildings and transportation. Uh, Water Design Build Council and DBIA work very closely together. They have a 
a very strong strategic tie to each other. Um, and the DBI is having an excellent conference coming up, both transportation focus and water focus here um, end of March. And uh, highly recommend that. They, they have a, also extensive education program. And finally, um, if you really want to go in depth, AWWA um, has a has a book that many of us collaborated collaborated on. It's a it's a pretty thick textbook if you really want to dive into the weeds. So maybe we'll back up here, uh, Joe, to the um, to the uh, Water Design Build Council. We'll leave that on the screen so you can write down that website if you're interested. That's probably the go-to source for water wastewater as a starting point, and then DBIA for other types of projects. All right. So at this time, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in, and we'll spend a minute answering those. The first question we usually get um, relates to progressive design builder CMAR is, is cost competitiveness. A lot of owners are very concerned that they're not getting a proposal with a fixed price bid, and um, you do have to amend the contract and sometimes go back to a board to get approval on that GMP. And um, we often talk through with owners um, how an open book pricing process can ensure price competitiveness compared to a hard bid process. And that's something to really look at as you're considering these models. So we do have one question here. Uh, question is, with a design build project, how should an entity deal with a potential sole source situation with an engineer of record we probably will have an advantage on a water or sewer project. It is difficult at times to obtain other proposals. Well, that does happen uh, from time to time. Uh, in any competitive scenario, anyone that's interested in the project is going to come and look and try and determine their ability to compete. Uh, I think as an owner, you don't want to uh, necessarily create a uh, situation where you don't have that competition. Uh, you know, I'd, pile on with, I'd pile on with two perspectives on that is one, consider CMAR if, if you're in, at least then your construction part of it might have a broader market-based approach and, and right. it might be the one engineer around who can do the professional side work but, but broaden the, the uh, construction side out. The other is to consider a performance-based approach and invite outside folks to come in with creative, innovative ideas. And so if you have the type of project that would lend itself to out-of-the-box thinking, you will find the industry is quite willing to put in the intellectual capital to win projects based on innovation if, if, if the specific project you have in mind you know, allows it or supports that. Uh, we have another question. Is it a good idea for a CMGC scenario to hire an owner's representative? Well, uh, just like design build, that can be a good solution for an owner. If uh, you're new to CMGC or integrate project delivery, uh, you may find it's uh, going to make a lot of sense to bring in an expert to help guide you and assist you during the process. So, so it's, it's certainly something that's done in industry, certainly appropriate to do so. And the, the other way we see it often done is that the, the advisory scope falls to the designer in a lot of CMAR, CMGC scenarios. They actually um, help select the CMAR, participate in the selection as part of their design scope uh, because they're the ones who are going to have to work with a contractor. So some owners do it that way as well. Any other questions, go ahead and type those in. While we're waiting one more minute, I do want to remind you that the annual conference is open for registration June 20 through 23rd in Breckenridge. We hope you'll join us. The preliminary program is online, will be mailed out. You should get it the first week or two in March. Fantastic sessions this year, so we hope you'll join us. This webinar uh, on the delivery models is a about a day and a half training course condensed into 45 minutes. So um, Water Design Build Council offers training at cost um, and you can contact them. And TBIA has extensive training along um, their Rocky Mountain region here and um, it's very low cost as well.
Well, we have another question. How is the interaction between the engineer slash architect different for a DB versus CMAR and architect? Well, maybe we start with a CMAR first. Uh, as Leftwood mentioned earlier, you're going to hire your engineer or architect based on qualifications like you normally do really in a design bid bill. However, in the CMAR or CMGC, if you prefer, you're going to hire that uh, CMAR shortly after you hire your designer, and they're going to be involved in the various gates uh, of design, say 30%, 6%, 90%. So what's going to be different just in a CMAR from DBB to begin with is that instead of your engineer or architect going through 100% design and then putting it out for bid, you're going to have the CMAR involved in commenting, offering constructability comments, uh, value engineering, construction cost estimates, uh, to help guide how you continue the design. Uh, so there's going to be stops in the process. When you move on to design build, uh, it's going to change quite a bit. In a fixed price design build, really to a large extent, the design builder is working through their design process. They're still doing their uh, constructability review, their construction cost estimates at the various design gates, and they're checking in and reviewing that with the owner. Uh, Progressive will look a lot, progressive design build will look a lot more like the uh, CMAR aspect because uh, really the owner, the engineer, architect, and the builder are gonna be very deeply involved during all the, all the design steps. There is certainly a school of thought um, and historically opposition to design build because, uh, because of the, the sort of theoretical potential that a designer can be pushed around by a contractor and end up working for the contractor and not the owner's uh, best interests in a design build. In my experience, that um, that uh, view has been largely discredited by the success of design build, but um, it's certainly a valid perspective that's out there. And I think um, you know you have to take every project on its face for um, how a team will deliver and and to whose interests they'll work for. Great. Well, with that, I want to thank our presenters today. I hope everyone found this to be a very helpful and informative webinar. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and have a great weekend.